Um, yep. All right, so let's just go ahead and get started. Sure. Um, so, um, relief printmaking is any style of printmaking where um, you are creating the image by pressing the paper to the surface of your plate. And the plate itself can be many different things. Um, so you're using the top surface of something. Um, woodblock printing or block printing. There's woodblock and linoleum, stamps, which is rubber, um, even um, screen printing is still in the relief category. Um, that get that one's a little more ambiguous, but it's because there's relief printing and intaglio printing. Intaglio is what is etching. Um, a, a lith lithography is technically in the relief category. It's just so minimal, and the oil and water nonsense gets involved. Um, oh, letterpress. Well, letterpress is definitely relief printmaking. Um, mm -hmm. So any of like the engraving etching styles where you're digging into the surface and then you are pressing the paper so hardcore into it that it digs into the hills and valleys that you created and it pulls the ink out of the cracks. Intaglio. Relief is almost everything else. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's why I was saying relief printing. Um, and we are going to concentrate on block printing. Um, you can pretty much use the same techniques for wood and linoleum or stamps. Um, uh, in the um, links that I put in the group, I'm going to screen share for a minute. I said that, and this is confusing. Oh. Uh, portion of screen. Uh, oh no. Did you turn screen share off? I don't think I ever set it up on this computer. Hmm. That's okay. I remember looking oh, at the links. Hang on. It, I don't think it's going to let me do it because I'm doing recording at the same time. Hmm. Um, okay, so uh, within the links, um, I showed two different kinds of carving surfaces. One is the battleship linoleum. That's how I learned about it. It's the gray linoleum. Um, that is more traditional. Then there's the easy carve stuff, which is just, it's a lot of fun. It's really rubbery and bendy, and it's apparently a... Um, a nylon or acrylic, something like it's plastic based. Um, so it's really great for kids and it's really great for beginners because it's just very forgiving um, and you don't have to use a lot of pressure when you carve and you don't have to worry about damaging your tools with it. Um, there's definitely drawbacks. Um, it is too easy to carve for some people. Um, you can accidentally split it really easily. Um, and it's plastic. So if you're wanting to be plastic conscious, don't use that stuff. Um, the battleship linoleum is all natural. It's made out of like calcium and like other minerals all smushed together. And then they, the backing on it is um, burlap. It's just natural twine and stuff like that. It's pressed into it, dried. Um, the mixing agent and binder is linseed oil. So that's why it has that smell. When it's new, <laughs> it has that smell. And it should be a little, you should be able to like wave it a little bit. It's not gonna be like flexible, but it has a little bit of a wave and a bend to it. Um, because of the linseed oil, um, over time, it will dry out. It'll get really hard, really stiff, and it'll crack and get like brittly and f like flaky and not flaky, grainy. Like when it breaks, it'll get grainy along the edges and it's just, ugh. Um, so that's something to be conscious of when you go to store your plates later, um, that uh, you might need to warm them up or you'll need to like 
take care of them long term so the linseed oil keeps it flexible. Um, but conservation of materials is a completely different topic. Um, so with this, I am going to show you tools um, that can be used for both woodblock and linoleum block printing. Um, the little speedball kits are awesome and great in general shapes. You have um, the same ones that can be used on both media. Um, over on, so again, I'm on Galen's profile, but if you go to the Joe one, you'll see samples of Mokuhanga, which is Japanese woodblock printing, getting even more and more refined. Um, so you can see the differences. So um, the Sakura is mine. This is my Mount Asama piece that I did as well. Um, these are two from my sensei. So this was his postcard he did for this year. And then this was a different piece he did that he gave to me um, because it's just a really intense example of Mokuhanga that there were in this flower and the reason it looks like it's glowing is because there is 24 impressions of color just mm. in the flower. Anyways, so um, you can get really refined details in this. Um, what's happening here is he used extreme pressure and use the wood grain to make it look like water. That's so cool. cool. Anyways, um, these are uh, mid range to professional grade wood, uh, wood carving tools, um, which work beautifully on linoleum. Um, and then these plastic candle ones are like student grade ones. They're, they were great to learn on. Um, now I am frustrated by them, but um, I have a variety of shapes and sizes between all of these. Um, so uh, where is my dang camera? This end, okay. I lied. There we go. Oh God, you can't see it. Um, how should I show these off? Huh? Well, that works, I guess, over on the Galen one. Um, shoot. So you have U blades, V blades, straight and angled. That's all you need. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> You don't have to go crazy with shapes and sizes and everything like that. You just have your big, medium, and small. That's it. Um, the only specialty blade that I highly recommend you getting a hold of or trying to figure out an alternative to is one of these suckers. Um, this blade is used only for carving your kento. Um, it is flat on this side and then beveled very specifically on the back side. That you have it beveled this side, this side, and the top and straight 90 degree angle. This sucker is what you will cut your registration with. It is the only thing you cut with this. Um, in Western style block printing, Registration is such an abstract concept. Um, you can still tee and bar. It's more difficult. Um, I've had, I had professors tell me to tee and bar. Hang on, let's back up and talk about tee and bar. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in Western style printmaking, you will make your plate for your image. So use this as an example. Um, this is the outline layer for the Sakura piece. And on this, you would put a bar, a tick of a bar, a straight line here, 
And then on this side, you would do another tick and make a T. And so then on your paper, you have it lined up like this and you map out where your image is supposed to be and you put a T and bar on your paper as well. Now, I had some professors that you would make a grid and you would put your plate on the, the, the press bed with the T and bar lined up and then you would make a grid for where your paper is with T and bar again. And so when you went to lay your paper down on top, you would line your T and bar and the paper sits down properly. Hopefully, it doesn't always work. Um, again, different teacher told me, put the paper down first and you line it up with your T and bar. You have your T and bar on the back of your plate. T and bar, maybe, hopefully, you can still go wrong. It's fucking frustrating. Like with the copper plate etching, with, uh, when, uh, with lithography, with uh, screen printing, with all the other styles, like TM bar always worked and I was good at it. Freaking block printing never made sense and it was it just blah, 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 blah. It was so frustrating. I didn't get good carving techniques. I didn't get good registration techniques. It was so frustrating. Japanese style has a kento. Um, and so on here, you have this straight line and a little half circle. And this is on the corner. It's always on the corner. And then you have this guy that you make full up and down and like three quarters of a circle. So these two lines are your registration. In pre planning, you plan where your kento is going to go with your drawing. You always transfer your kento with your drawing onto your plates. So this is always going to be in the same spot. And when you use that knife with the right technique, you cut your kento and your paper will always fall exactly like I have never had registration be so good and so simple as within this method. This will also work with linoleum. So it's so simple so easy i love it okay kento for days um and so this little guy is like the professional grade japanese tool that i got whenever i was out there i'm sure there's a western alternative i haven't looked into it um but if you keep your design small you can do your own version of a kento very easily it's just key that it is straight cut down um, and then angled up slightly so like the ink doesn't get all smutzed up in there. That will come later. <laughs> um, so, um, some version of a Kento tool is important. I would even say this tool is the most important one. Your angled knife. Da, 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 da. The angled knife. It's like a bigger, thicker version of an exacto blade, kinda. Um, so you have a 45 degree. Oof, man, that is. I've damaged this one. This is the cheap one. <laughs> Anyways, you have your 45 degree angle. It is beveled on this side, and this side is flat. This is the one tool for the one technique that I always needed to know <laughs> in undergrad and grad school when it came to linoleum and wood block printing. This is what makes all the clean shapes. Um, and this is where you get your detail. This is where everything starts with this guy. Um, and I'll talk later how you use this, but you want a really good angled knife if you're using, especially if you're using wood, but linoleum is just going to save your life and make cutting your shapes so much quicker and easier, more efficient, and less likely to have smooched surfaces that kiss the paper and ruin an area of a print. Um, yes. Um, then the U shape and the V shapes are honestly more about digging out um, big areas that you don't want printed. It's just how efficiently can you get all of that scraped out? 
Well, see, you cut that out of a bigger piece of linoleum. Um, which is fine, which is great. However, with the Kent, like you have no registration on that. You have no area of the Kento. So this one board has three plates on it. You have this one, um, which it, I used it for two different layers. So uh, anyways, I'll ramble about that later. But my Kento is here along the bottom. Aha, I have two more plates that use the same Kento. So this section was printed at a different time, this section printed at a different time. So two plates, same Kento. Flip it over, ba bam, two more. All on the same piece of wood. And it gives you space for the Kento. It gives space for the paper to lay down smoothly on the same surface. Um, one thing that will happen whenever you cut out shapes like that, whether you're hand printing or on a press, you will emboss the edges. Um, this prevents embossing um, because when you carve, um, you carve out, you know, your shape and everything like that and you get all this smooth and great, but then along this edge, you make it a very gradual rise back up and you keep it super baby butt soft smooth um, whenever you carve it out. So it's just, it glides right up and the paper doesn't get marred. Um, sometimes you have to, uh, okay, you can see it along this edge. Um, maybe, uh, I had to, uh, bevel off this edge because it was starting to emboss my paper. Um, and so you, you just round off, smooth off any hard edge. <laughs> um, and it works beautifully. You don't have, um, accidental embossing. There's totally blind press stuff that happens and it can be beautiful and fun and it's great like textural effect but then that means you really have to be on point with getting rid of anything that causes an embossing so when you have the intentional ones it really pops that's super advanced for like beginners ignore everything that that i just rambled about um embossing is bad <laughs> um so yeah if you have like one plate you map it out pre, again, I'm gonna keep saying this pre-planning, but you have a, a bigger piece, pre-plan it to where you have sections dedicated for different plates within the one piece of linoleum or the one piece of wood. Um, be economical, <laughs> it's absolutely part of the process. Um, so yeah, the U, U gouges are great for clearing out spaces. I love this guy. Um, it's man, it's kind of hard to see. It looks like a small kento, but it's not. It's a straight edge on this side, and it's slightly rounded on the corners. And so what happens when you're digging out areas, digging out, oh, actually, hold up your eyeball again. So on your eyeball, you have all of like the areas that you were digging away, the big spaces. You go along with this sucker, and you scrape away those high ridges. And it smooths it all out and you're able to like get this gradation from the print area to the base really smooth really easy really quick and clean so you absolutely don't have to worry about kiss problems and this is the tool that i was using along the edge of where i was getting the embossing to just skim off the surface to round it and make it smooth um and it causes the gradation um i don't actually use v gouges um, I would probably use a V-gouge for super minute details with like grass or hair or like the eyelashes or whatever to like make the angle and carve it out um, because it's just really quick and deep and I don't need that a lot because um, a lot of my, my lines and shapes are really fluid and rounded and so like the harsh just doesn't work. Yep. I used a V gouge for the detail in the yeah, iris here. Quick, um, sharp line. And yeah. we're going to tick out the end of it so it flicks mm -hmm. away and you get that point, which is absolutely what a V gouge is for. My lines just don't, my line quality doesn't have that, but it's what a V gouge is for. Um, uh, so that's a smaller straight edge. 
smaller U. I have two other sized um, angled ones. I have my medium and I have my super sharp professional tiny one. <laughs> like it's smaller than my pinky nail. Um, and I have a teeny tiny, ridiculously tiny uh, U gouge. Like, it, it, so there is, I, I call him my art grandpa. So this little art store in Saku is where I was getting a bunch of my supplies and just the most adorable grandma and grandpa owned it. And I would come in there and be like, hello again. <laughs> Hi, I'm looking for this. And like, we'd go scrounging through like, it was a treasure trove. It was like one of those cliche places that was just crammed wall to wall with art supplies and art. And like you could just peel like the entire reason I have like my little Mokuhanga kit is because I was digging through things trying to figure out like how do I piece a kit together and then I found one. I found like a little student grade kit and I was like well there's no price tag on this thing and there's like this gritty layer of dust on it that I was like is this for sale and they're like where did you find that uh yeah it, it's obviously for sale let's just price it out we don't know we don't know how long this has been here um anyways um yeah he he could barely tell uh, initially if it was rounded or a, a u-shape or a v-shape until like he actually read it and he was like oh it says round so it must be round <laughs> Um, and it is, but it's tiny. Uh, that one's tiny. That's the one on um, the Sakura piece. This is one of the proofs. Um, so, uh, you uh, that's what I was using to get into the holes to carve out the center of those for the yellow layer. <laughs> uh. That was intense. Um, okay, so that's carving supplies and your plates that you should be getting a hold of. Um, use water-based inks. Just gonna be healthier and cleaner. Um, for Western style woodblock and linoleum printing, you will want a brayer, which is the rolly thingy. You squick out your ink and you roll it. And um, there is a definite technique to keep it clean and consistent. Because you want clean and consistent. Um, and I will go over this next time. But you will want a brayer and you will want a water based ink. Um, you can get little kits and basic colors. Um, that can help you decide on things and obviously like mix and make your own colors. I am an, a huge advocate of never use something straight out of the bottle. It's boring. Most of the time it's way too saturated and just doesn't give a lot of life to your art. Even if it's just a little, a little blip of black or a little blip of white, to just alter the color something different than just squicking it out of the tube and rolling it out. Um, so you want, oh, a palette knife is very helpful for this as well. Um, you don't need a very big one, just one to where you can move the ink around a little bit because a lot of times it will tend to separate in the tube so you'll squick it out it'll be clear at first and then the pigment comes well use the palette knife to like blend it together make a line and then you can bray it i'll show you next week um why um why water-based ink specifically uh because otherwise you're going to be dealing with oil-based inks and that brings on a whole other level of like <laughs> fumes and messiness drying time clean up Clean up. Clean up is a clean up is a hassle and a half. Um, <laughs> that's really it. That's the only option you have in the states is oil based or no? It's the only option you have anywhere is oil based or water based. Mm -hmm. Speedball has great quality little water based things that you can order really quick on Amazon. There are other water based printmaking inks out there. A lot of them are for etching and not for block printing. 
and they work really strange <laughs> when you try to block print and you end up wasting a lot of kind of expensive ink. Um, so just get the speedball water-based block printing inks and it's good to go. Um, professional level uses oil-based ink, but then you have to deal with the linseed oil, you have to deal with the chemicals, um, the you, need, you need good ventilation, and then you have to use like three layers, three different kinds of other chemicals to clean it up properly. So, because a lot of times, this drove me crazy when I was a studio tech at, in both Atlanta and in France that the beginner students just would not clean things well. They would clean to where you couldn't see it anymore. But the glass slabs that we have everywhere is like the cheaper glass, so it has a green tint to it. So that's going to automatically hide part of the, the ink on the slab. And then like the paper underneath is really old and maybe yellowed or it has other stuff on it. So you're not actually seeing that it's still dirty. And you won't see that it's still dirty until the ink is already fully cured and dried on the slab. And then it's crusty and a pain in the behind to get off at that point. So um, the thing about properly cleaning up oil-based printmaking ink is you go from the least caustic to the most caustic. So you start out cleaning with olive oil. So you have to scrape up all the unused ink, slab it away, like if you have enough, you store it for later. If you don't have enough, you put it on newsprint and you throw it out. Um, oh, and you have to have proper containers to throw this stuff out. You can't just throw it in the garbage. You have to have OSHA standard like cans where the stuff goes. It, you don't just put it in the trash because it's toxic and it's going to damage the environment. So clean it up use oil and you start scrubbing it down. Well, you just use oil on oil. So yay, it gets it up, but then like you still have to clean the oil. Um, and so then you use pig wipes, which is a really heavy duty cotton uh, uh, lint free cloth that seems like a really fancy paper towel. But again, you can't throw this guy out. You have to recycle it specifically. So there's a different can that you use. It's just for pig wipes. Um, and so you clean with that. You spray everything down with um, isopar, which is stinky, and it starts cutting through everything. Um, and then the final round is simple green, which picks up the rest of the oil and grease and cleans the table off the rest of the way. So, and all of that has to go into the special bins to be recycled properly or thrown away properly, disposed of properly. Like you have your red can, which is like nasty, gross, like dangerous throwaway, and yellow cans where the pig wipes go to be recycled. Uh -huh. So, unless you wanna deal with all of that and get those nasty chemicals and the smells and the fumes, water-based ink is your friend. <laughs> yes. Um, and the Japanese style of woodblock printing is watercolors. You print with watercolor and rice paste. That's it. All those beautiful classic woodblock prints coming out of Japan and even some of the eight, like, uh, Chinese things, it's still just watercolors. It, yeah, so like. This, How do they do that? Does it work just with wood or also linoleum or? I don't know, I don't know. This is, that is wood, I know for sure. Um, so I have not experimented with that and I don't know if I am going to try because I'm more interested in just getting better at Mokohanga first. But this is watercolor. It's just watercolor. It's, it's how you put it down. It's, there's completely different sets of like ways you get the ink onto the plate to make that happen. I'm not going into Mokohanga. I don't know it well enough to try to teach it. I can teach basic block printing, um, just adapting some of the Japanese techniques to linoleum is simple, easy, and um, will make it a lot more fun and less frustrating. Um, 
something you have to think about but worry about less is sharpening your tools. Um, with the wood, it's very important. You have to have sharp tools every step of the way. As soon as it starts to dull, like you risk injury, um, but then also you risk ruining your print, ruining a section. Um, and so I have these two uh, whetstones. This one, this cream one is 3000 grit. This one is, I don't remember. This is my rough one. The red one is my super, I think it's 700, I don't know, a thousand. Um, this is my rough one. So when I need to reshape something, like say part one of the blades chipped, oh, my angled brush is chipped or brush, my angled knife is chipped. So I'm gonna need to reshape it on this guy. This is technically polishing level one. Um, I need to get a hold of my Arkansas whetstone. So I have a polishing level two. So I reshape with this guy and then I refine and polish with this guy. And it works well. Um, I am not the most knowledgeable about sharpening blades yet. That's brand new to me because of the Mokohanga stuff. Um, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> um, and there's definitely different styles of whetstones and whatnot. Um, we're lucky that we live in Arkansas and we can get a hold of Arkansas whetstones because that's world renowned stuff. And I didn't know it was a thing until my teacher in Japan freaked out when he found out I was from Arkansas and have an Arkansas whetstone like this big and that, that big. Um, well, who knew? Thanks, dad. Um, that's, that's some of the stuff that's trapped in the studio right now. That's with my leather working things. Um, what's interesting about both of these guys is they have profile shapes. If you look at the side right here, um, it's kind of gimmicky. It's okay. Just okay. Even, even my teacher was like, good quality stones, but the shapes kind of defeat the purpose. So for the most part, I use the back of my stones. Um, yeah, you can see all sorts of marks on it. Um, the backs of my stones and I just manually reshape things and manually use it to carve up stuff. Um, this one's a little better because it has the, the shapes raised up like this. And so um, if you drag it across the end this way, like it, it helps to reshape stuff a little faster. Um, the only time I use the grooves on this is when I'm on my little bitty um, U blades, my two smallest U blades. I'll use this, but still, I this one's cleaner. I still go to the back and I reshape everything on the back. Um, this one actually lives in the box like that <laughs> more often than not. Um, so the cream one, I have to soak in water first um, to get it to like naturally form a slop, which is like a lubricating layer. Um, for the blades, the redstone, I do not. The redstone is a dry stone, even though it's a whetstone. <laughs> um, wet with an H, W-H-E-T, whetstone. Um, yes, I am rambling a lot. Okay, so we ran through tools. We ran through, um, I say plates, and so, um, you have your wood block or your linoleum block, and when you carve into it, this is now a plate. So it is the plate you print on, and this is a wood block print. Um, terminology, vocabulary, glossary. I should make a glossary of this stuff, but you have your block and your plate. So you know about a couple of the linoleum blocks you can get to create your plates, um, pick out whichever one you want for what you are doing. If you get the battleship linoleum, the gray stuff, it is thinner, you will need to get a baron. This is a very Japanese one. Um, the links that I put on the page are for Western style ones. They are heavy duty and they're bigger and they will work beautifully with your linoleum. That's what they're really for. 
those big plastic ones, Western style ones, are for linoleum. This is this is for woodblock mokohanga technique. Different style. Don't you think you want one? No, you don't want one of these. This is this is very particular, and you need a whole extra slew of stuff to use this. Pick out either one of the ones that you want from the links on the event page. One is cheaper, lighter. It will probably break down sooner. The other one is awesome. I've used it before in uh, the shops in Savannah and Atlanta. They're great. They will last you forever. It's just, I think it was like $30 or something. So if you really want to invest in this because you know you want to do it for a while, go ahead and spend the money on that one. It, it, it won't, it won't, um, it won't do you wrong at all. Um, but if you don't know if you're going to like this technique, just go ahead and get the $10 one. It's fine. They will both work for this project. Um, uh, if you get the easy carve stuff, you can skip the barren and you will use hand pressure to make your print. Pretty simple. All right, now on to composition. Whoa. Okay, and uh, again, I'm going to go back to pre-planning. Pre-planning is so important. Um, absolutely like sketch and do all of that and get an idea of like what you want to have your image be. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh my god, pile of stuff. So um, last week I showed like the different levels of sketching I did for my Sakura piece that I did in Japan. Um, if I can find them a sketch. Here we go. Okay. So this was part of my watercolor sketching phase. And then this is my pre-planning phase. It's really hard to see. But, um, and also, um, I had it in, so that was my watercolor sketches. Too many books, goodness. Okay, which way did it go? Oh, good lord. Ah, too many sketches. Dang it, I thought this was in here. Ah, there it is, okay. So you saw my watercolor sketch. And then this is my initial pre-planning sketch. Let's see if I can pull this up. So this is in my sketchbook. Um, you can see where I was figuring out my kentos. Uh, let's see that, here we go. Um, initially I had them I had them out here, but then my paper was too small. I had to move them around. Um, but I did all of that on this layer. And you can see the different colors, and that's me messing around with my colored pencils that I sketch with. Um, it's kind of crazy. It, all of this, I have other ones that I've planned out. Like All of this is just the colored pencil lead that I have in my mechanical pencils, and that's how I sketch. Um, last week I showed a crazy number of like mechanical pencils that I use and it's just my process. Um, but the idea is that you can see it here that I have my black ink is my line layer. Green is for the leaves. The yellow is for the pistol and stamen. Um, and the pink is for the flower. And the intention is that I was going to do a fade effect as well on the flowers. And then right here, it is showing that I am layering the green, yellow, and pink together to make the shadows. Um, Pre-planning. <laughs> so I'm not like cutting a whole nother layer just for shadows and two, like color theory is involved to let it play around and like create its own shadow effect. Um, super important that you figure out all of your layers beforehand. Now for this project, I want people to just concentrate on either just all lines, so one color, your entire image, just one color. 
And if you really, really want to be like, go get her about it, only two colors. Don't challenge me on this. Like, do not do more than two colors. I will talk about it. But as a beginner, just do one color. Just challenge yourself on one color because you can have so much fun playing around with shape and texture and negative space with just one color. Like, I wish I had my portfolio stuff with me, but that is locked away in my studio in Bryant, in the back of a room, at the bottom of a flat file cabinet. Like I can't get to any of it, but you can have so much fun with just a single tone. Um, and why I liked attempting this before is because I felt like I was really drawing on my comic book inking skills um, just in a different media. That when I was an inker, it was all about just using black to show an entire cityscape or an entire action scene. And so you really have to rely on line form and texture with one tone. So believe me, like you can get super advanced and crazy complicated with just the one tone. Again, if you want to be a go-getter about it, two tones, but then that second tone needs to be a really freaking simple shape. Don't be crazy about it. Don't be crazy about it. Because like my first Mokuhanga piece, like my my teacher was like, You're you're trying out some advanced stuff already. And it's harder to see because I didn't color everything in. But this is this is the sketch for the mountain piece. Um why it looks the way it does is, and it was only, well, it ended up being five plates, four kentos, so four registration marks, but five plates. Again, that, again, that's why he's like, you're making this far more complicated than it should, but you have printmaking experience, so okay. Um, so like four plates, or five plates, four kentos, so four times I had to register for registration. Um, the more layers you start adding onto these things, you exponentially increase the chance of it going wrong. <laughs> Just on, because even before you ever get to the printing part, you start carving something wrong, you're not gonna know it until you print. And so just start off with the one plate, maybe two. And so um, you, I'm sure you've seen this and mind you, this photography drives me crazy, but it's when you have a black and white image and then like just the lips are red. <laughs> I hate, I hate that kind of photography. I really hate it. But if you want to do two plates, think about it like that, that you have like, everything is in blue color and then like the sun pops out in yellow. Like just think about it like that. <laughs> Don't okay. get more complicated. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Um, like, uh, and so I have a lot of images pre-planned that I just, one night I had all these different ideas, so I sketched them out and I've pre-planned them already. So this is, this is a view from one of my high schools um, whenever the leaves were changing. It was just, it was a really stark angle of the tree line on top of the mountain. And so I sketched it out and again, it's, uh, um, it's gonna be five plates, but distinct, like I don't make it more complicated than it has to be. It's just as simple as possible. Um, the, the huh. This one over here is just three plates. I have the line work, the branch color, and the leaf color, that's it. And then it's just gonna be how those three things interact together. This one's a little crazy. Um, it's still four plates, but the shapes are really big and loose. And this one's literally, I'm wanting to play with layering colors. And so it looks crazy complicated because it is, but this is intentionally playing with colors with four layers. Um, and then, uh, again, pre-planning, um, I could, this is three plates again, but it becomes complicated only because, again, pre-planning, <laughs> I keep saying that word. So three plates, but you see I have my gray layer 
my leaf layer and my details. And it's how these layers interact with each other and gives more tones than just the plates. So um, going back to the soccer one. So uh, the tissue paper. Oh, why do I do this to myself? Um, so. Tissue paper. Our tracing paper is your friend. Yay! Um, I took this. Boop. That's a lie. Yeah. Anyways, da, 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 da. put it in here. Traced it out. It's one to one ratio. Um, and then like I transferred all my notes about layers and colors. So I then have this on tracing paper. And then you have transfer paper. Um, what's cool is uh, he liked using this red stuff that is double-sided. So you can use it on both sides. Um, one piece of transfer paper can actually last a hot minute. Like there's, I transferred both the Asama and Sakura on this piece, and I can still use it a couple more times. Um, what's nice about this is because it's double-sided, when you trace one layer, again, okay, so this is, pre-planning is important. So um, I have lines, leaves, pistons, and shadow, or flowers. And so I use this one piece, tracing paper, and I trace only the one section that that color is going to be on. So with, um, and you put the tracing paper on the wood and you trace just the area for that one color. Um, whoops. So when I was tracing just the lines, I just traced this and, um, on this layer in particular, I tried to trace like the line quality that I wanted. Um, on this layer, I'm tracing the leaves and all of the shadows because I want the green to go in the shadow area too. Um, and I technically, whenever I was tracing it, I filled it all in. And so when I went to carve, I was leaving all of the red behind. That I wanted the red to stay put and I didn't, didn't want to touch it. That's how I was tracing things. You can just do the outline and protect the outline whenever you go to start carving. So tracing paper is your friend. Um, uh, and why, why I kept saying this is cool is so when I use this one, um, it put the tracing carbon on the wood and on my, my tissue paper. I put it on both. So I definitely knew where I'd already drawn and it wasn't repeating anything. Um, what's more common, especially here in America, is you can just get like uh, a, a little, it looks like it's the same kind of box that like aluminum foil or plastic wrap comes in and it's a roll of transfer paper. And I like blue, that's from my comic book days. Um, there's non-photo blue tracing paper that exists and it's amazing, I love it to death. It's easily erasable. Um, so get a hold of some of that. So when you transfer everything, you can stay consistent. Again, your, your registration marks, your kento, oh yeah, it's gonna save your butt. So when you go to sketch, calculate where you want your kento to go. It should be about one centimeter away from your drawing, wherever you want the edge of your drawing to be, the one bar, and the, the L bracket at the corner, this should be the edge of your paper and it has to be at minimum a centimeter away from your image. Um, doesn't matter if it's linoleum or wood, like keep it a centimeter or more away. Like if you want really like a lot of negative space, calculate that out with your sketch and your drawing and put it away. So when you get your piece of paper later, You'll put it into the L corner 
and you'll line up the edge on the straight line and let the paper flop into place. And it's, it will work every time. You properly okay. hold it and you let gravity do its thing. Don't press, don't, don't massage. Nope, just let it lay down. You just let it go boop. That's perfect. I swear, gravity is your friend this time. Um, yes, so, uh, ooh, like I have these ideas for what I want to do. Um, this is actually based off of the theme that they were going to do for IATC this year. I know. Yeah. Right. So, sad. so I had a couple of ideas for that. Um, but these are a lot of colors. So I'm like, well, let's not do that as an example <laughs> for this. Um, oh, look, there's another sketch for a different Mokohonga. Um, oh, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. And so this is what I'm working on instead. It's going to be one tone. I'm just going to do the line art for it. Um, I want to work on her head a little bit more. But this will all just be in one color. I'm just going to do the single layer. Um, and so what will end up happening is even though it's a small sketch in my little bitty, like this, this guy stays in the drawer, at my work desk. So when I have an idea, I pop it out and I sketch it. Um, this will get transferred into my big sketchbook. And that's when I'll work out the details of everything. And then I will put that on my transfer paper, or I'm sorry, my uh, tracing paper. And then I will transfer that to the pieces of wood that I have. Um, I will do this with wood because that's what I have. Um, and so um, I will work with a small piece of wood, no bigger than a four by six. That's what I'm going for. Don't want anything big. I don't want anything complicated. Just postcard size is awesome. Um, so try to go for that as well. Postcard size composition. It can be vertical, it can be horizontal, whatever you want. Just remember when you plan out your image, your kento will need to be one centimeter from the bottom of the wood. Don't get it closer than this, I swear to God, because then you have it'll break out the side of your linoleum and huh, it's your SOL. So um, for me, like my finger is right around the width of a centimeter. So think about it. So it goes like centimeter, kento, centimeter drawing, like yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got uh, it. So um, the, my kento was really far away on this because I was using a bigger piece of paper. So if I was transferring this to this piece of wood, which doesn't work at all, but uh, I'd be lining it up somewhat like that. Centimeter away here, centimeter away from the bottom, and see the image starts up here. So, yes. Okay, I have rambled for an hour. Do you have any questions? Okay, yes, I have a question because like I'm thinking it through my head and trying to figure out how the image is gonna be flipped. So do I draw my print like I want it to be or do I draw the mirror image? Cause I know you like, okay. you know um, what I'm talking about? Yes. This is why the tracing paper is important. So draw it how you want it mm -hmm. and then you trace it and we'll you flip, flip your tracing paper. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I was I like, like to do it I was thinking where, it through in my head like this way and this way yeah. and this way. Um, which way? <laughs> I also tend a lot of times um, when I'm working through compositions, if it gets flipped, for the most part, I don't care. Um, if I do care, then at the tracing paper side, I'm like, oh, boop, fixed. Okay. Bye. So yeah, um, it's the tracing paper there that you, you do that. Okay. Voice. That makes sense. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, any other questions? No, I mean, I've done this. Well, you've, you've seen what I've done with this before. So yeah. I, I have like, I have like a general idea of the problems I will likely run into and you have addressed those problems okay. and those questions. So I feel like it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
thin next line time. will always be the hardest to carve, mm -hmm. um, but I will specifically talk about carving ne techniques next time. Okay. I want this week people to concentrate on making their composition. So come ready with a composition? Yes. And tracing paper and transfer paper and such? Yes. Go ahead and have your composition done and it on the tracing paper. The tra yeah, tracing paper. Okay. Um, I will do that. Then um, <laughs> double check Kento's to make sure they're okay. And then, yeah, trace it. And then I will go over the basics of carving uh, mm -hmm. your, your image. Um, whoops. There's, um, there's basically three, three passes of carving that will happen. Uh, the first one is carving the outlines. The uh, second pass is digging out your gutters. And the third pass is creating your bevels, the, the, the gradation of shape to mm -hmm. smooth everything out. So refining. Um, the outline part is the most tedious. It will take the most amount of time. But when you do it slow and steady, improper you're you're just going to save yourself heartache and headache later on so just know that that layer does take a lot of time but it's worth it when you do it correctly just fair warning <laughs> so yeah you have homework from me oh no <laughs> all right yeah i'll come up with a a something something to do a something yeah we'll see i've been re-watching the mandalorian so it might be that <laughs> Yeah, do some kind of Baby Yoda thing or some men Mendo thing. Something like that. Or what's the chick's name? Kara. Yeah, do something about Kara because she was such a badass. Yeah. Oh no, I finally cussed. Like it took me an hour and I finally cussed. Oh, no, 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 girl. There was a couple times away at the beginning. <laughs> Did I? Oh, man. <laughs> I was like, is she going to notice? Should I? No, tell I didn't. I didn't at all. That was the funny. Only you should go rewatch it. No, Do you have any? <laughs> I don't like watching myself on these things. Fair I think enough. the only time I was I managed to go months without cussing um, was over overseas. I was teaching. <laughs> I don't need them to be <laughs> my bad habits. That's terrible. Yeah, I did, however, correct them whenever they used curse words grammatically incorrect on the chalkboards. I had to decide: pro, is pro this move. worth it? because they totally spelled this word wrong, but they have the grammatical structure right, I'm just gonna erase this. And then sometimes, well, they spelled that wrong, but this grammatical structure, or they spelled that right, but the grammatical structure is wrong, I'm gonna fix the sentence and leave it up. I'm sure they love that. The, the Japanese teachers thought it was hilarious because they could see me whenever I would notice it because they would always do it on the backboard at the class of the room. Like I would just phone in on it and be like, hmm. They're teaching. I'm going to go do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So anyways. Uh, I'm gonna stay yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to try this out. Good. I think it'll be fun. Yeah. Me too. Yep. While you've been talking for the past hour, I've been masking. <laughs> I'm so tired of this tape. <laughs> what, are your, what are you doing? Um, so I have a project for school where you're doing altered text, right? Oh, and yeah. so I've got a page and I've got the parts I want to not be speckled dotted, masked off with the tape. Oh. And then I'm going to speckle dot the rest of it. I've got text and planets yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And so <laughs> I've just been like, curve, please, the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's thin copy paper. No, it's the actual text that they oh. ripped the pages out and distributed. Oh, okay. All right. Interesting. So I took the masking tape and like put it on my pants yeah. a little bit so it's not sticky anymore. And then just was like. Just enough to protect it. Just enough to protect it. Yeah. Hey. You got this. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, send me a message if you have questions during the week. And okay. I'll send you a picture of the sketch once I come up with something. And you Perfect. can be like, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe do this instead. I'll be like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to set up another event for next Sunday for part two. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.